Hello, Vincent Wall here to welcome you to the latest episode of the Future of Business podcast brought to you by Mazars in Ireland and focusing in this short series on the significance of ESG, environmental, social and governance issues and how businesses are reporting or more likely will be reporting on their performances across those three increasingly significant topics. And as always, we're joined by Mark Kennedy, Managing Partner of Mazars in Ireland, to join us on this series. How are you, Mark? Hi, hey, Vincent. How are things? Uh, good form, thanks. And as always, you will introduce our special guest today and the topic that we're discussing. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, as we said, we were what we were trying to do with this series was to, at each point, look at a different angle of ESG and a different where, area where it impacts the economy, and from and, and to learn really from people who have a lot of expertise in those areas. And to that end, I think banking and finance generally is obviously key. It's key to the um, European Green Deal. It's key to how the world works in many ways. And so I was very um, keen to have somebody from that background join us. And fortunately, we have a Mazars, an expert in London. And again, I thought the fact that London is home base for our guest is, is quite important because here in Dublin, we often look to London, to the capital markets there as a reference point. So I'm delighted to, that we're joined today by Leila camden Fotso. Leila is a partner of mine in Mazars. She works in the banking team there, but is also has worked here in Ireland and has worked in a number of countries. And in the last uh, year or two, she's been working with clients and some of the agencies that are looking at the ESG issues, and I think is an interesting guest from that perspective. So nice to see you, Leila. Hi, Mark. Hi, Vincent. Welcome, Leila. Um, I suppose maybe just first you might inform us and our listeners how you got interested in this whole area of the relationship between banking and finance and, 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 and climate change and how how banks in particular are going to have to account for themselves in this area. I think the, the trigger for me was actually has a name. It was Mark Carney. So when he was uh, he was still governor of the Bank of England. Um, and he was becoming increasingly vocal about the topic, you know, lots of speeches and statements. So it was easy to anticipate that regulation was on the way. And obviously at Mazar, we are very much interested into, into banking regulation. So we started, you know, monitoring what was coming. And, um, and then we thought, why don't we do a study with a think tank, so UMFIF, uh, to look at how not only the Bank of England, but other central banks as well were going to, uh, to respond to the threat of climate change. So that that's really the I think the the the, the milestone or the, the kind of starting point in the in this journey on you know working on cent- on on climate change and and the regulation and the response from regulators uh, to to climate change. And I think maybe just to add to that, the AMFIF report is important here in Ireland as well. AMFIF is the organisation which. It's really the the club for regulators around the world, central banks and other regulators. For the two or three people listening in who mightn't know that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not they don't advertise widely, but they are a very influential group in the thinking of central banks and regulators. And so we collaborated with them, not just in the UK and, and Leila was I suppose the core team that worked on this, but we, we included quite a number of regulators, including our own central bank. 33 central banks, actually. Leila can tell you more about yeah, it. Yeah, you, exactly. might, you might kick off the conversation then, uh, Leila, by, by giving the, the, the principal findings of that report. And I suppose uh, the focus that, that central banks generally and regulators generally are now bringing on this whole issue. Yes, sure. So I think I think the major finding from the from the survey was the fact that um, so as I said, we spoke to thirty three central banks across the world, and seventy percent of of respondents um, said that they they consider climate change as a major threat to financial stability. And then the question was, um, how do they respond to that threat? So we um we what we saw was that uh, in each, first of all central banks are going to to integrate climate change into stress testing. So stress te- climate stress testing is going to become mainstream. Uh it's starting already in the UK uh, from next year. It has started in France as well uh this year. So that's the first point. The second point was around disclosures. Uh, so climate-related disclosures are going to have to be incorporated into financial disclosures for banks and other financial institutions, which I think is a major thing. And um, 
And I think we can discuss it later, but the, the, the task force on climate-related financial dic- disclosures, which was launched by Mark Carney as well, <laughs> uh, when he was chairing the FSB, uh, the Financial Stability Board, is really emerging as the standard of reference for, for climate disclosures. The third point was around uh, green finance, so green bonds, green loans. Central banks are increasingly looking into how to standardize how you define green fin- how, would you, how you define green bonds and, and green loans because currently it's very much industry led and there's a risk you know, of green, greenwashing and not being completely, completely transparent on how these pro- what these products are, finan- are financing. Sorry. So central banks are looking at setting uh, you know, very clear criteria and principles on how to define these green uh, products. Just getting back to the the, the whole stress testing uh, area, that will involve regulators, central banks and regulators, literally going through the 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 lending policies, but also the loans that are out there by banks uh, and how they're exposed to climate change, the liabilities that might build up. Yes, definitely. So I think the, the first important thing is to have a picture of what the risks are currently. So looking at banks' balance sheets, how is climate change impacting the traditional categories of risk that we know? So, you know, credit risk, market risk, operational risk. And then more forward looking, looking at different scenarios. If we know that we are currently on a trajectory to meet, you know, the Paris Agreement target of uh, reaching net zero by 2050, what does that mean? For those banks, in terms of you know, how those risks are going to evolve, so it's really it's really uh, a, a picture at today, as of today, and also looking on a, on a more forward looking and on a scenario analysis uh, on a scenario based uh, basis actually. And it brings you, I think, into you know from a, a real world perspective, it brings you into a question of what assets do banks hold, what assets do their clients hold, true you know, which they're now exposed to from a lending perspective and issues around valuation, issues around trapped assets, changes in work mm-hmm. over time. And again, links back to the macro, um, I suppose, policy changes that the European Commission are proposing. So it's finance is really the the join between those aspirations and how we make things work in the real world. And I presume as that process gets more complex and sophisticated, Banks will be required, perhaps, to set aside more capital in reserve, if if climate related risk assets are are, are deemed to be uh, a significant element of their balance sheet. Yeah, absolutely. And there is um, so as part of the European Banking Authority's action plan on sustainable finance, uh, I think it covers the period until twenty twenty five. One of the measures they are looking at is whether there should be a green weighting factor. So basically adjusting capital requirements, taking into account the level of capital re- of, of climate risk that sits on, on, on banks' balance sheets. Given, given that, 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 that context, that base that we've set through that survey uh, that Mazars was involved in, uh, Lena, which uh, regulator is most advanced in, in pushing this forward? Is it perhaps the Bank of England because of Mark Carney's influence? I think def- I would say I would say yes. The Bank of England has definitely been leading on this, um, and the Bank of England was going to be the first central bank to run a, 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 a climate stress test across the whole financial sector this year, which has been postponed now because of COVID. So uh, Bank de France actually has uh, has gone ahead with the plans to to run the, st- the stress test this year. So I think yeah, I would say Bank of England, Bank de France as well to some extent. Are, are probably you know the, the the central banks that are leading on on this. You've probably been monitoring, Mark, where the uh, the ECB and the EU regulators are. Well, I, I think um, and and think uh, Leila has has touched on it there. I think it's been left at, at this point to national regulators to push ahead with their stress testing. Now the ECB does take a periodic look at the banking sector, and Leila will probably correct me, but every three years there's an update on that. So I, I suspect we'll see the EU take, you know, pushing that agenda gradually. Um, and I think, like the UK, the Irish regulator has clearly indicated that it's looking at this, but I don't think there's anything happening in 2020. Again, COVID has been an impact there. Um, 
to to maybe tra- track back on one of the points, and I, I think it's something that we've discussed in one of the other podcasts. The area of disclosure is obviously a, a key issue, and I'm I think as I said at the start, for Irish institutions, London is always a useful reference point. How are UK banks looking at the area of disclosure now, and what kind of issues are arising over there? Yeah, so as as we said, the, the Bank of England uh, has been leading on this, and I think in 2019, the Bank of England was the first central bank, the first regulator in the world to set out its ex- expectations on how banks should um, incorporate climate change into their governance, risk, risk arrangement, and disclosure uh, arrangements as well. So the the expectation or the recommendation from the Bank of England is that banks... Um, follow the TCFT recommendations, so the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, um, and that they, they start you know, publishing information on how, what governance arrangements they have in place, what scenario analysis have they performed, what risk management have they put, uh, arrangements have they put in place, how, how have they updated their uh, risk management framework, their risk policies, what metrics and targets are they using to follow the impact of climate change on their financial exposures? Um, so that's really, I think, the TCFD. And, and also, maybe it's, it's interesting to mention that the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, has done a consultation earlier this year on um, making TCFD disclosures mandatory for listed companies from 2022. So the, the, the area of disclosures is really becoming a big topic here. And I think it goes back to what we were saying about uh, scenario analysis, because as part of disclosures, banks really ha- need to do a, a, an eno- enormous amount of work into um, assessing how risk is going to evolve under a set of scenarios. And it's not straightforward. There's a lot of data to collect from counterparties. Uh, there's a lot of, of modeling uh, to be done to do it. And, uh, and so, yeah, I think the large banks have been investing probably a bit more than the smaller banks currently in the UK. Uh, there's also an effort at the, at the regulator level to, to coordinate what large banks are doing and to, to share the, the knowledge that they have been uh, building on that with the smaller institutions. So there is a climate financial risk forum in the UK where uh, banks are working together and insurance, insurance companies as well with the regulators to define guidelines and uh, to provide, you know, practical examples and recommendations for the rest of the industry on how to address that. When we talk about disclosure, um, we often start thinking about the behavioural changes that that drives. And I'm wondering, are you starting to see in UK institutions so that they're planning different kind of behaviours in the future? And I'm thinking here in terms of lending policy, the kind of areas that they want to get involved in from a business perspective. Is that starting to have an effect, do you think? I think what we have seen, uh, I guess it's the case in, in Ireland as well, is uh, a lot of uh, exclusion policies. So banks ha- are, have started by saying, we're not going to finance um, um, fossil fuels from this date, for example, or we're not financing um, you know, those kind of very high carbon emitting industries. Uh, so that's the sort of behaviors. I think it's the, it was probably the most straightforward things to address. Um, it's, it's a bit more challenging when you, you think not just in terms of, of physical risk, but also in terms of transition risks and how is the climate transition, the transition to net zero going to affect every single sector of the economy? Um, then it, then it becomes more complicated. But yes, I think to answer your question, Mark, we are starting to see these kind of changes. I'm just saying, I think it's just the beginning of the journey and, uh, and it's going to be, yeah, it's, it's, there's going to be, to need to be more work to really address this in more thoroughly, really. And banks and financial institutions are obviously going to have to prime their own internal resources for this new approach to risk and to disclosure. But I presume there will be a role for auditors here as well. Yes, definitely. There is there is a question of of how do you how do you make sure that the information is is of good quality uh, that it has been prepared in line with you know the, the right standards because uh, I think the challenge here the the reason why disclosure is so important is because we we want investors to be in a position to take the right decision. So the challenge is really making sure that the information is 
is comparable as well, and is decision useful uh, to use the, the language from the TCFD uh, framework. And yes, I think that's where auditors are going to, to, to play an important role into reviewing the information independently and providing that third party assurance that, you know, the, the information is of good quality and can be relied on by investors to take their decisions. But Mark, maybe you want to add something on that because you are definitely more of an auditor than I am. <laughs> no, no, I think you've covered it pretty well. I think, um, and we've talked a little bit about this on another podcast. I think, you know, the, the direction we're traveling is validated reports, whether it's by auditors or whether it's by other third parties. But that question of independence and trust underpins all of that and then picks up on the issues that you've raised. But I think, Vincent, was you had another question, did you? Yeah, yeah well, I suppose we've been, we've been talking about yeah. the... In one way, it may be called the burden of of additional disclosure and risk assessment that is coming very fast for for banks and financial institutions, Leila. Um, but during this transition period to, to net zero carbon, the the target being twenty fifty, but obviously we we're going to try and get there earlier. Where are the opportunities for banks in terms of lending opportunities and in, in terms of bond issuance? I think. One of the big, uh, and yeah, I agree with you, it's not just about risk, it's definitely also about opportunities. It's, I think it's important to have that in mind. And uh, actually missing out on those opportunities is a risk in itself for financial institutions. So they really need to, to pay attention to how the economy is changing and make sure that they make the, the right decision in the right time you know, to, uh, to adjust our business model and to remain relevant in the new world. Um, so I think the, the, the opportunities are actually everywhere, but one, one area that is really important is infrastructure. Uh, and sustainable infrastructure is going to be really key for, uh, for meeting our climate targets, but also the other sustainability goals, not just climate. It's really important and, and there is a, a significant gap in infrastructure finance. Um, so, I'm actually uh, on that. I'm, I'm working on a, an, an initiative with. I mean, Mazar is part of an initiative with um, with other with a number of financial institutions, including HSBC, on defining a, a new label for how to define sustainable infrastructure, and and also the ultimate goal is actually to to scale up private capital into sustainable infrastructure. So uh, so we, we have HSBC in the initiative. You also have. Uh, IFC, uh, Climate Policy Initiative, uh, OECD, and uh, and the World Bank, and uh, there's, so there's been we have been working on this for for a couple of months now, and by by beginning of next year we will have uh, the new label will be um, will be published for consultation, and it will be a, a set of principles on how you define a sustainable infrastructure asset, whether it's a it's a hospital, it's a port, an airport, you know, all, all of that. So it, I think infrastructure is definitely one of the areas where there is going to be a lot of opportunities, especially in the context of COVID as well and, and the post-crisis recovery for financial institutions. But, but, but that labelling process, as, as you call it, that, that is critical in terms of bringing consistency standards, consistent standards across the globe, hopefully, in terms of... of both both projects themselves uh, and how sustainable they they are in, in 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 truth rather than just greenwashing as you referenced earlier. Yes, that's right. I think labeling is definitely standardizing, you know, ensuring comparability is the the key um, issue and the, the priority in the whole debate around sustainability. Um, because obviously, it's it, it's it's also com- it's a com- it's a commercial opportunity and it's very. The, the investor, the appetite from investors is very high on, on sustainability, on sustainable products. I think investors now want not just uh, to achieve high, he- high yields, but also to, to have positive impact on, on the planet and on people. Um, so we need to make sure that we have very clear rules in place for investors to know what they are put, putting their money into. Yeah, and I think it's also, and, and again, you know, it's something we've talked about in the past, it's the key to releasing state aid in European funds and so on, this kind of common uh, taxonomy for describing what is a green or sustainable project. And it's a great example, I suppose, of how if we get that right, you can bring private finance and public finance together to achieve 
the right goals at the end of it of a net zero economy. You know. But I, I presume it's not just in terms of actually uh, triggering public-private investment partnerships and also more private investment to fill the gap that the, the public sector can't, but also to help the regulators in if there's a consistent standard there, that, that helps regulation as well, doesn't it? On that side, of course, yeah. And again, you know, it's it's something that Leila probably knows far more than I, but there there's a there's a mutual benefit or there's a there's a multitude of benefits from getting that, that piece of the puzzle right, I think, you know. And what I was thinking about was more just the nuts and bolts. When states go to build whatever it is, railway projects or other infrastructure projects, the EU is saying you won't get funding for it unless you meet the right standard. So we're setting a bar in the right place. And as, as Leila's saying, there's a huge investor appetite privately for the same sort of investment. But on the, the point about labelling is also relevant to regulators and to how they look at the makeup of balance sheets. So the work that you're doing there is also going to feed into that risk analysis that we referenced earlier in the discussion. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I think maybe on that we we can... Go back. I'm not sure if we mentioned that before, but the EU action plan on sustainable finance is going to have, um, there's a big component on, on, on actually standardizing and, you know, labeling what is sustainable and what isn't. So the EU taxonomy, I think you mentioned that before, Mark, is a, is really, is a classification system for defining at economic activity level what is green and what is not. And the whole philosophy of the taxonomy is really aligning the EU economy with uh, Paris targets, so being net zero by 2050. So an activity is sustainable if it's if it's on track to be uh, to to bring the economy to that target of being net zero by 2050. Uh, so yeah, the, the, the taxonomy is, a, is an important, very important aspect in in regulation. Uh, it's going to it's really going to change everything. I mean, the moment you have a definition that is agreed for what is green, <clears throat> then you can start having a green weighting factor, as I mentioned before, you know, defining capital requirements that are based on the level of greenness of assets. I think currently it's, it would be very challenging for a regulator to do anything of that sort because there isn't an agreed definition of what is green. We can, we can come up with, with, you know, common, uh, common sense definitions, but we need to to make sure that that definition is very is really accepted by everyone, and then we can start having those discussions. And you know, how do you de- how do you define the levels of capital? How do you define what is a green bond? Because currently we, we have green bond principles, but they are industry led. It's not a regulator that has defined what a green bond is. Um, so yeah. And in your view, Leila, will that labeling process? Uh, get down into into the detail of the of the asset, the the infrastructure asset itself. So not just that it's a good thing like a hospital or a or a school, but the the raw materials that go into the construction of that hospital, the the processes involved in in how it's built, the impact on the community and the environment in which it's built. Those kind of issues will come into the the broad labelling process over time as well, will they? Definitely, and uh, actually that's a good question. It's very complicated actually when you. When you look at an infrastructure asset and you try to define whether it's sustainable or not, because you know, if you think about a building, you can think about you know the level of energy efficiency of the building, for example. But with um, with an, an infrastructure asset that's going to generate revenues of uh, I don't know thirty, fifty years, it's it's very very complicated to think about all the implications in terms of environment, in terms of social implications. And in terms of governance, obviously, uh, you mentioned the community aspect. So the the project that we are working on with HSBC and other institutions I just mentioned is actually looking at that and defining all the dimensions of uh, sustainability for an infrastructure asset and also building on all the other initiatives that exist. So there is an initiative on what does net zero mean, for example, for an infrastructure uh, asset. It's not... It's not that straightforward and it's not really something that the taxon- the EU taxonomy is doing because the EU taxonomy is looking at economic activities, not assets. So defining sustainable at asset level is not the, a layer of, of, of complexity. You're based in London, as we, as we said. Is Brexit having an influence on, on progress towards some sort of consistent process and, 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 and definition and standardization across between, say, the UK and the EU? Yeah, so I think th- there was a, it was a big question mark until uh, the beginning of this week, really. Um, you know, with the EU taxonomy con- coming into force from, from next year, 
uh, the, the, the EU regulation, sustainable finance disclosures. We were wondering whether uh, financial institutions in the UK were going to, to have to, to comply with those rules. Um, so the, the, UK, the UK, the government has confirmed that they won't, uh, they won't be onshoring the EU regulation on sustainability in, in the UK. Uh, the, the government here is going to work on a, on a, on a UK green taxonomy. But the taxonomy, so that, that means potentially, you know, further fragmentation of rules and for cross-border institutions having to comply with different definitions of what is sustainable in the EU compared to the UK. Uh, the government here has said, though, that they will build, they will leverage on what the EU has done on the scientific metrics to define what is sustainable. So hopefully we end up with a system that is not too different from what the, the EU has done, but it remains to be seen, really. And I think for very large cross-border institutions, the closer things can be, the better. It's it's difficult enough to to navigate regulation, but this is, a, you know, another potential challenge for bigger banks. And I suppose here in Ireland, we have a lot of institutions that are based in the UK and the US and so on. So it's something that we'll have to watch, I think. We have um, one question that we've asked all of our guests, Leila, which is um, an open question. and not, ju- not So don't confine yourself to the topic today. But really, if there was one thing that you'd recommend to businesses that they could do or that you'd like to see them think about in the in the next six months, what's that? What's the, the most important thing from your perspective? I think businesses shouldn't underestimate the, pot- the potential consequences of climate change on their business, uh, on their performance. I think even if you feel that your you think that your assets are not exposed to physical risks, if you look at the transition and the the very profound transformation that is going to take place for for our economies to get to net zero by 2050. But actually before that, by 2030, we need to halve our carbon emissions. So it's not that far off. You know, if you look at the next 10 years, the amount of changes that is going to happen is is very significant. So I think business leaders should really take the time to, to look at what that transition means for their business models and to think whether their current business models are resilient to the changes that are coming or not. Maybe they need to develop new services, new products. Um, what new risks you know, are, are emerging from that transition? What skills they need? I think, I think it's an important aspect. You know, I'm, I'm not sure we currently have all the skills we need in companies, whether it's at board level, senior executive level, and, and across all levels in, in, in firms. Um, and the tools and the data that you need to measure that, all of that. So I think I, I would say definitely think about your, you know, in the same way as governments have announced a transition pathway to 2050, every single company should be thinking about their transition strategy to, to, to 2050. And if I could just pick up on, on one of those points that you've made in that in that uh, summary, Lila, do you think the banks, both in, in London, here in Ireland and, and elsewhere have the expertise themselves to to make this new form of risk assessment or do they need to think about that? What sort of expertise do they need in-house to, 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 to make the kind of risk assessment and I suppose to pursue the opportunities that are there as well in sustainable finance? I think banks need to, they need, there, there are skill gaps. I think they, they, will, they all recognize that there are major skill gaps currently. Uh, they don't have all the skills and the expertise they need to, to work on that new category of risk. Uh, and what we see a lot now is uh, partnerships between financial institutions and academia uh, to look at, uh, you know, to research the topic, to develop the new tools that they need, the new techniques, you know, to measure risk and also to identify the opportunities, as you said. So uh, I think that's something to, to consider whether you, you need to, we need to work uh, in a much more multidisciplinary way than we have done uh, until now, I think. Okay, well, we might... Leave it there on that rallying cry. I'd like to thank Leila Camden Fotso from Mazars in the UK and of course Mark Kennedy, who joins us as always, uh, managing partner of Mazars in Ireland. Big changes coming, not just in terms of governmental policy and decisions, but at the banking and financial side as well, both on the supervisory side and the investment side. Very interesting discussion today, but until the next time we we'll leave it there. Bye bye. Mm-hmm.
Thank you for listening to The Future of Business with Vincent Wall and Mazars. We welcome any feedback to our podcasts and particularly your suggestions as to topics we should cover. You can comment and rate us wherever you find this podcast or on mazars.ie. Bye for now. <laughs>